afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you here this afternoon for our Let's Move Cities and Towns, uh, implementing policies that create healthy communities. We have three dynamic panelists with us, two mayors that are on the ground leading this both locally in their states and nationally, uh, Mayor Mark Stodla from Little Rock and Mayor Jack Reed from Tupelo. And we also are honored to have Tyler Norris who is with us to share with us uh, an invaluable resource we think that will be for cities around the country as you really are looking to identify where the resources is and in this space of doing more with less. Um, it will be a great, re we think, a very useful resource in a number of cities. My name is Leon Andrews. I'm a senior fellow at the National League of Cities, um, the Institute for Youth Education and Families in Washington, D.C. Um, I'd like to, for those, uh, just for a few minutes, frame the discussion. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the issue of childhood obesity, are familiar with kind of where we are in this dialogue, um, and why this is so important. Uh, 25 or so years ago, right, this is what the map of America looked like, of, what, of childhood obesity. You can see about, maybe, maybe there are places around the country where about 20%, under 20%, 15 to 19% of adults were obese. Five years later, six years later, many more states around the country, similar uh, in that 20, 15 to 19, but there's couple states that are kind of budgeting into that 20, over 20%. One of those states are here today that will be speaking with you, Mayor Reed from Tupelo, Mississippi, representing the state problem. Uh, four years later, the map starts to change significantly. And in fact, Mississippi uh, leading the way with over 25% of adults uh, obese. Four years later, the map changes again, right? Where again, Mississippi and Louisiana uh, and West Virginia uh, leading the way, right, of over 30% of adults obese. Another four years later, Mississippi is no longer alone, right? A uh, number of states around the country are obese, 30, over 30% 30 of the states are obese. And in fact, if you remember 25 years ago, the blue line was the larger line, and in fact, there's only one state that had that blue line still, and that state no longer has a blue line, which is Colorado. They're now over, they're in now in that light 20% 20, 20 space. So this is an epidemic. So how do we get here? With less of this, kids playing, walking to school, families eating healthy, and too much of this. <laughs> it's laughable but serious, right? You have people that have changed their lifestyles, walking their dogs through their car, playing video games, in their cars, going from one place to another, and the choice of food that you choose is probably a burger and fries. Going to exercise, because you're trying to do right, but you're choosing the escalator instead of taking the steps. And the consequences are significant, right? We know that childhood obesity is the number two cause of preventable, of preventable deaths in the United States. We know that the cost to the United States is $147 billion per year in related chronic diseases. The former Surgeon General captures it quite well. We may be facing the first generation of Americans that will live shorter and sicker lives than their parents. There are impacts beyond just the financial costs, right? You have physical health costs. You know, with increase of childhood obesity, you have higher rates of type 2 diabetes, adult onset in among, among kids, greater risk of heart attack, stroke, and hypertension. Mental health risks in terms of kids that are isolated and depression when depressed with teasing about weight and personal appearances. So the National League of Cities six years ago took this issue on. We've invested a lot of work in learning about what can cities do to combat childhood obesity. We have an action kit which you can download on this website, noc.org, I-Y-E-F, that highlights practical steps. We've done some work in a number of cities, as you can see some here. Uh, but recently, in the last two years, we focused within Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Uh, we've organized what we call around track one and track two, where we look at the issue of childhood obesity in large and urban cities, as well as small and rural cities. And we have a number of partners that we've worked with. This gives you a sense of the cities that we're working with in those states. Uh, in the track one, two of those cities are represented here with their mayors to speak about the great work that's happening in their states. Uh, but we also have Baton Rouge, 
Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and North Little Rock as well that have been a part of the Track 1 initiative. And we have over, 30, over 35 cities from the small and rural cities in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. We have also worked very closely with the First Lady's Office around her Let's Move Cities and Towns. Just by a quick show of hands, how many are familiar with the Let's Move initiative? Excellent. How many cities here in the room have signed up for Let's Move? That's cities, that's excellent. Um, and so there's a lot of great, exciting work. Over 600 cities around the country have signed up for Let's Move Cities and Towns, and a number of different examples of what they've done. There's a lot more that can be done. There's a new, new executive director that we're working very, looking to work very closely with to figure out what more we can do. Tyler will talk a little bit about what they're doing right now with, uh, Let's Move, uh, with the Let's Move initiative. So we're really excited about that being a platform. But for us, the work follows what I call Strategic 101, Strategic Planning 101. It's not rocket science, but it's definitely hard work, <laughs> right? Uh, in order to be able to really reverse this trend from 25 years ago, one program alone will not solve it, right? We're not looking for a mayor to launch a bike program, right? Or, we're not, or, uh, or a one-time event, right? It's a much more committed, uh, and stra uh, committed strategy, and our two mayors will talk about their commitment to this work. Um, and for us, it's framed very easily for us around looking at how do you develop and sustain effective interventions that promote physical activity, that, uh, that access, the access to healthy foods, and healthy eating among children and youth. For us, here's our framework at the National League of Cities that we use. We communicate in every city with examples of what we've seen. How are you reaching the populations that are at highest risk of being obese? What can cities do to establish the same partnerships with schools? Uh, how do you, in cities that have after-school programming, make the most of out-of-school time? Promote access to nutritious foods? Utilizing your parks and recreation and reshaping built environments? These are resources that a number of cities have at their disposal. Right? And a number of these areas, uh, you can use policy um, and, and do and, and where funding um, is not necessarily the driving factor as part of your strategy. How can you, afford, how can you find policy that are low to no cost? Is now that what we're looking for in an environment where funding is restricted, right? And that's what we want to be able to share with you. Low to no cost strategies, policies that you can think of. Your mayor's here, Mayor Stodl and Mayor Reed can talk about through their leadership about what they're doing to find low to no cost policies and strategies, how their leadership is effective. And so for us, very quickly, partnerships with schools from a policy standpoint, joint use policies, joint use agreements, Right? Looking at adoption of a wellness policy that's happening. You know, promoting of uh, breakfast in the school uh, programs that's happening in Savannah. Who, in, who here has a, an environment like that in their cities? Where kids are trying to get to school and so many cars and you got that one little kid trying to cross that crazy traffic um, space. Is that safe for them as they're trying to get to school? What can you do from a policy standpoint to address that? Low to no cost. Making the most of out of school time. How can you look at healthy standards, promoting active living, not just serving hot dogs and playing video games within your after school programming? And so there are a number of good models out there that we could talk about. Um, and even uh, Mayor Stodola and, and Mayor Reed can talk about. Promoting access to nutritious foods. Looking forward to hearing Mayor Stodola sharing uh, Mayor Reed talking about the Health on the Shelf initiative that, ha that they have in, in Tupelo. Or using EBT cards or WIC nutritional programs at farmers markets, which is a common uh, initiative. And Mayor, Mayor Stodola's leadership on what, they, uh, the, what uh, Little Rock did a couple of weeks ago, uh, launching, uh, hosting a healthy food policy summit that's very focused on policy change. So a number of things we could talk about in the areas. And creating environments like this, where people can go to farm, uh, farmer's markets or create community gardens, right? Creating a, a lifestyle. Reshaping the built environment, a natural space for cities to think about through your parks and zoning. Complete streets policies. How many folks have heard of complete streets policies? A natural space uh, where you could look at that or emphasizing walkability. Essentially what policies do, this is in Arkansas, Changing a community that goes looking like this to a community that looks like this. With more walkability, more access, people that want to go and visit your store. This is a small town in Arkansas. Changing a street. How many, how many communities and cities in here have a street like this in your, in your city? That goes from here to something like this. Adding a bike lane, some trees, making it more walkable. How many people have a, city, uh, a street like this in your town? 
A street like this? Do you like this or does that look a little more attractive? Spaces that you can, how many folks have a, in a, a street like this? We create multi, multimodal transportation options within your community. This is what we're talking about. Parks and recreation is another use and another space that you can think about through joint use agreements and community gardens and healthy options through your parks and recreation. And so there are a number of policies that we could talk about. I'm really excited about the mayors that are here and, and Tyler here to, sh to share specifically about the range of different policies. What we want you to be able to understand is that there are a number of different entry points. There's a menu of options to be thinking about this as you're looking about what you can do through your cities, in your cities, to promote healthy communities. And so the National League of Cities, we have a list of options that we've learned across the country about what that looks like, whether you're talking about policies for recreational opportunities or policies for fresh and healthy food, access to fresh and healthy foods. So we have more information. If you want to get any information from us at the National League of Cities, here's our contact information. Uh, please write it down. My contact information is there. If you want to uh, receive one of our action kits, you can contact us uh, or want to join our network. Uh, uh, feel free to uh, contact us to be able to join our network as well. So it's my distinct honor to introduce our first speaker, Mayor Mark Stodla. Uh, from the city of Little Rock. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Little Rock is one of five cities that are part of our Track 1 through the Robert Johnson Foundation. I've had the privilege of working with Mayor Stodel over the last two years and to see his leadership on this issue in so many different ways. And so I'm really excited for him to come before you can, and share about the great work that, you, that is happening in Little Rock. And so if you could please join me in welcoming Mayor Stodel. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you here to uh, learn what uh, what uh, can happen in a city uh, in terms of the issues of uh, taking and actually developing policy that then turns into an action plan. Uh, we've been fortunate to have the the benefit of uh, the tutelage of the National League of Cities and, and Leon's uh, department to help us a lot, and I'm happy to be here with such a distinguished group of people. Um, Leon covered a lot of the uh, empirical information about why this is important to cities and why it's important to city councils and mayors. And I want to just uh, let you know a little bit about Arkansas and Little Rock is kind of a, a setting for that. First of all, Arkansas ranks number one in childhood hunger and in number one in food insecurity in the United States. One in four children go to bed hungry every night. The children living in food insecure households, of course, are at a higher risk for developmental and academic problems. We know that frequent illnesses uh, lead to truancies, they lead to not being in school, uh, nutrition, in nutritional inadequacies, and uh, the studies show that undernourished children uh, under the age of three cannot learn as much as fast or as well, and so a lack of nutrition has a direct relationship on a child's ability to learn and to concentrate and to perform well in school. That's not uh, probably unusual when you look and see the statistics uh, educationally about our country. Um, Little Rock's most glaring access, uh, low access areas are located in specific neighborhoods that we know are low income residents in challenging neighborhood conditions, which means uh, broken streets, no sidewalks, um, dilapidated houses, things of that nature that, that affect the built environment. Uh, Little Rock metro area uh, uh, is we're the city of Little Rock's 193,000 people, and uh, yeah, so, so it's large in, in many instances as it relates to that. Yeah, in the six surrounding counties, we have 31 high schools, three of which are considered to be the nation's lowest performing high schools in the country. 33% uh, of the high school students in the region do not graduate with a regular diploma. Uh, and nationally, we know that uh, we've got uh, childhood dropouts, uh, 8 to 10 dropouts end up in prison. 75% of all prison inmates uh, uh, are high school dropouts. So you see that it really is a holistic issue as it affects many different issues other than just the issue of, of what's on the table or what's not on the table. Um, we found out that the odds of a child being overweight or obese is are 20 to 60 percent higher than among children where the neighborhood conditions are more favorable and the more favorable social conditions. So if you have unf unsafe housing or, uh, and unsafe surroundings, poor housing and no access to sidewalks, no access to parks and recreation centers, these types of things really affect the ability uh, uh, to uh, deal with the issues of childhood obesity. 
The bottom line is we know that the built environment, which we as municipal officials have some control over, does matter. And the ability to tie into those issues along with the issues of healthy uh, and nutritious foods and physical activity are very, very important. 70% of the uh, students in the Little Rock School District uh, qualify for free or reduced lunch uh, and, uh, and priced meals. Um, we know that obviously the inadequacy of income in a household uh, directly affects uh, the pover directly affects children. So that living in poverty means that many children go hungry. Uh, these distressed neighborhoods, therefore, are our challenge as municipal officials. Obviously, uh, the uh, goal of Let's Move is. Uh, uh, for we elected officials is to help parents make healthy family choices, to create healthy schools, to provide access to healthy and affordable food, and to promote physical activity. Those all sound relatively easy, but as uh, Leon mentioned, the, the ability to actually do something about those is very, very difficult. This, is, of course, is uh, the First Lady's call, as we know, to address the issues of childhood obesity. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we've got to have some goals, and goals lead to policies, and policies lead to action. So we've got to try and do what we can to help make parents uh, uh, make healthy choices, to create healthy schools, to provide access to healthy and affordable food, and to promote physical activity. The first step that we believe is important is that in terms of policy, you've got to have a theory of health behavior uh, for change, and that is the model that we have. Uh, thanks to the support and the technical assistance grants that we received from the NLC and from the Foundation for Mid-South to address these overall community health and support issues. Also uh, receiving support from the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Center that has a, 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 a department or a division to prevent childhood obesity, which happens to be located in Little, in Little Rock. We were able to call upon a variety of, of good minds to try and help us with this foundational framework. And uh, the approach that uh, I'm showing you here is one that's called the social ecological theory of behavior change. How do you actually really change behavior? And it calls for us to address this then uh, in, a, in, a, in a variety of ways that all have an influence and ultimately try to change and reverse the trend that Leon mentioned. So you've got to deal with the individual level, the interpersonal level, the organizational level, which is a challenge, I can tell you, as a, as a city, to, to see all the organizations that actually are involved in these matters, many in tremendously disparate ways and with lack of communication. Uh, the community and the public policy realms. Um, right here, I'm, over, I'm giving you a bit of an outline on that in terms of, in terms of the issue of these solutions uh, through policy. Uh, that are evidence-based. And as we studied in our community, that these are the things that contribute to childhood obesity that we observed, uh, as listed here in terms of individual, interpersonal, organizational, community, and public policy. And as we had began to take this policy and begin to identify then and evaluate where the policy gaps are and at all levels, and what would, what would happen if we address those differences? That sounds a bit theoretical right now, I suspect, but when you talk about it in terms of uh, specifics, it begins to make some sense in terms of the issues of policy. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, back in um, early March, um, I delivered a policy address as part of my State of the City speech that identified what I believe to be some real policy gaps and some policy initiatives that I felt were important uh, to address this issue and to help to make the decision to uh, have healthy choices uh, a more easier choice for our citizens. It also had to do with the issues of healthy living and active living. Um, the first thing we did is we, I, I met with every one of our Little Rock School District board members in my office for one-on-one -on -one meetings to talk about specific policy initiatives involving a partnership between the City of Little Rock and the Little Rock School District. Uh, interestingly, they had not been asked that before and we received unanimous support to do that. I announced a, a full partnership with the school district that called for an immediate adoption of a school district citywide joint use agreement that would lead to creating community gardens, school-centered garden enhanced nutrition curricula at all, at all elementary schools, and also would result in the development of farmers markets that are located at strategic uh, school district elementary schools that are located in and near food deserts, and the implementation of a revised school district truancy policy that would shorten the number of truancies and the time required to intervene in a child's life 
uh, uh, before dropout situations occurred. We learned, and this is the policy aspect, we learned that it took nine truancies, nine unexcused absences, before the school district would even prepare a file for referral to the city to deal with the issue of truancy. And then we learned that it took seven, anywhere from a minimum of three months to nine months for that to get into the juvenile court system. Well, a lot of times these kids had graduated. Uh, we found out also that, that the large percentage of these truancies really were happening in the elementary grades. So the real issue was to intervene very, very quickly to not so much uh, because the kids were at fault, but because the parents were at fault, and to try and get a court to try and intervene to do something about it. Uh, we partnered uh, with the Alliance for the Healthier Generation, which also is in partnership with the Clinton Foundation, uh, the American Heart Association, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, then to introduce a healthy schools program into the Little Rock School District and the Pulaski County School District, which also has several schools in our city. Uh, we then partnered with the Chamber of Commerce as well, again, dealing with the issue of policy, to deal with local commercial realtors to develop incentives for the recruitment of supermarkets to be located in food deserts and to determine what the methodology is that, that these, major food, these major supermarket chains have in terms of why and where they decide to locate. Uh, at that point in time, I felt it was time for us to try and bring some people together. So, as Leon mentioned, we held a Healthy Food and Active Living uh, Summit in September of this year. That was moderated by Leon, by the way, and it, it featured Tyler Norris, who you're going to be hearing from in a minute, uh, as our, one of our first keynote speakers, uh, that would address the social justice and food access issues and, and talk about the measures to improve our opportunities for active living in our community. Uh, we also announced a healthy vending policy for all of our city of Little Rock uh, uh, buildings and properties, and I have met with our area hospitals to seek uh, their support to join me. Uh, interestingly enough, you would think that they would be the first to jump on. They are not, and you will find that from a policy standpoint, you're going to have to push pretty hard on it. I'm even giving them a 75% healthy food option as opposed to the 100% that, that we are going to we are going to implement. That's one of the nice things about being a mayor is I can I can do that. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we uh, we're working hard to get not only our, our hospitals but then to go after our major our major corporate employers to do the same thing. Um, I am finishing up today the uh, mayor's uh, uh, car free challenge. I'll tell you that I. Um, uh, uh, this actually happened, uh, uh, and, and it truly is low cost, I will tell you. Uh, I happened to be talking with some of my bicycle friends, and uh, they said, why don't you uh, get rid of your car for a week, and we'll announce it, and we'll publicize it. Well, it kind of went viral, and, and we've got several hundred people now that have done this. I still have my, my bus pass in my pocket here somewhere, and, uh, and I have gone the week without using my car. Um, and it has really created a lot of discussion. <laughs> That's my first applause for that. Thank you. Uh, I've been on YouTube, and I've been on a couple of blogs and a few other things like that. But uh, uh, it really, uh, I figured out I've saved about 50 bucks this week in gas, which is uh, really uh, uh, one of the unintended good consequences of it. Obviously, it's good for your body, and it's good for the environment, and it's good for your pocketbook. So I would encourage... Uh, other councilmen and officials to, uh, to challenge your citizens to a, a car-free week. Um, probably one of the most important things is that we identified in our city over 70 key stakeholders that had expressed interest in participating in this whole idea of a community wellness initiative. Uh, that, and, it addressed, and so we put together these 70 stakeholders to address all sectors and levels of the social, ecological model of health behavior change and to talk about the policies that are necessary and then the action plans that will help people make healthy choices. Uh, one of the things the city can do is really be the umbrella to, to pull people together in, in a common way to continue to dialogue and discuss because what we found is that people are stepping on each other on these things. They really are. They're asking for the same kind of money. They're going after the same grant. Sometimes the grantor agencies are funding the same duplicate uh, uh, programs in cities, and it really creates a, a, a real strong confusion, uh, which really, really dissipates the message and the focus of the message. So uh, it's very important, I think, that from a city standpoint, you can exercise some leadership on that. Uh, we created the, uh, the Mayor's Task Force on Youth. Uh, the purpose of creating a youth master plan that uh, is using the, uh, the uh, NLC Mayor's Toolkit. Um, and we announced a, a major uh, childhood obesity initiative called Love Your School. 
And so in partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Center and uh, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, Metroplan, we uh, developed a graphical website portrayal uh, relative to the neighborhood health of our city by focusing on a 15 to 20 block radius around our school districts, our school, our school elementary schools, and uh, to look at a variety of, uh, of categories that portray the relative health of the neighborhood. We inventory sidewalks, dilapidated housing, food deserts, and the like. I want to show you, and this is something that your Metropolitan Planning Organization can do. It didn't cost us anything. Uh, we just asked them to do it. As I mentioned, these are some of the issues that we identified um, in, uh, in, in the speech that I gave in terms of where we had to take policy and make changes. Um, uh, the, um, you'll see here uh, our Metro Plan was able to take all of our elementary schools and to uh, identify those and you can click on each one of those schools for a detailed neighborhood map and it will give you more detailed information about each one of them. This is an example of, of uh, uh, one of the uh, screens that you would see on the legend where various colors are used and hash marks that show where parks, supermarkets, transit lines are located uh, whether or not a school or neighborhood is located in a food desert. Uh, the shading in here also indicates whether they're within a five minute walk of transit where bike paths are located. Uh, indicators of areas that are within 15 minute walk of a grocery store. The absence of sidewalks is also illustrated in a ranking on the parks from zero to five with the higher score indicating more active recreation uh, such as tennis courts, baseball, soccer fields, and the like. The lower score being a more passive park. This is all information you can get off your GIS format and create as an opportunity, a portal for your community to use. This next example is an example, and i would show you this just to show you the one of the poor areas of town. Um, the, uh, you'll see that there's Martin Luther King, which is an elementary school, and Gibbs, which is also an elementary school. It is a magnet school. Um, the hatch marks that you see there show that both of these schools, at least one of them is directly located in a food desert and one is on the edge of a food desert. Uh, you'll see there's very little transit, very few parks or sidewalks, very little green in the area. Uh, the degrees of poverty are indicated by the number of call-outs that you'll see, the 65% and 12% on the school that indicates the free and reduced lunch percentages. The MLK, 77% of the children qualify for free uh, uh, or reduced lunches. Gibbs, which happens to be a magnet school, uh, which provides for interdistrict transfer and for more school choice, uh, 43%, again a reduction. Contrast that with a elementary school in a more wealthy portion of town in the Pulaski Heights neighborhoods, for those of you who are from Arkansas that are here, and you'll see at the, uh, you'll see at the Forest Park Elementary School, you'll see that there's only uh, 16% uh, in the same situation, and I suspect through m and transfers and interdistrict transfers, a lot of those are, are coming from other locations in the city. So, uh, we decided that as a policy umbrella that we had to be specific, we had to be targeted, uh, and we wanted to address the individual, the family, the social institution, to align organizations together and to focus on our local policy. And so that's really what this social ecological framework, the policy umbrella that I talked about, is supposed to do. And again, let me give you an idea of what some of the research showed. It showed that, uh, that um, our school children in the elementary schools, grades K through 5, do not receive instruction, uh, nutrition instruction, and they're limited to 60 minutes of physical education per week. It's far below the 60 minutes per day that the CDC recommends. Uh, this means that children are not being taught, i.e. knowledge, they're not being given the knowledge or encouraged, they're not being given the behavior to, to, to know about healthy lifestyles. And additionally, uh, what we did is we chose two elementary schools to demonstrate these issues. Uh, one that has growing rates of obesity uh, for students over a seven year period with a moving average on the BMI trend and in which attendance was populated by children living in or near food deserts. They were classified as high poverty schools again with a large degree of free and reduced lunch attendance and the research revealed that the family members, the adult family members um, would favorably respond to opportunities to participate in home gardens and to opportunities to experience meal preparation and meal budgeting classes and so we use those kinds of things to develop a program through Love Your School that would address those issues. Um, as I mentioned, we, we also learned about the overlapping of the multiple funders and funding organizations that there were and the lack of coordination. 
thanks to uh, thanks to uh, an, an award from the Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Rockefeller Foundation, we uh, received a uh, City of Service uh, Leadership Grant Program, which allowed me to hire someone to actually help put this policy issue, this policy initiative, into action. And so combined with the National League of Cities and uh, the Foundation for Mid-South, uh, the Technical Assistance Grant, we were able to launch an intensive six-month research project uh, to identify the collaborators and, to, and, the, and uh, develop an obesity intervention program that addressed all levels of the social ecological model that I mentioned. And many of those collaborators, as you see, are on the, on the slide here, the Foundation for Mid-South, our Little Rock SERS program, um, our, our university, our, the Arkansas Center for uh, Health Improvement, uh, obviously the NLC, the school district, and the like. So uh, what we've done is we've uh, uh, created an, uh, an age-appropriate nutrition instruction program called SNAP-Ed Nutrition, and the curriculum was taken from a grant from the USDA. Uh, we've uh, got a garden enhancement at school garden component that supports nutrition classes and grants uh, from cities of service. We've got 40 raised bed, bed, uh, raised bed gardens in our schools. Uh, we've got a garden at home program so that you take it from the school and you, the same kids are taking it back to their home. Uh, uh, again, age appropriate uh, with uh, free raised beds and soil and seeds and plants and gardens uh, uh, to mentor for a year at home. Uh, exercise, we've got an exercise uh, program uh, that is being done at the schools uh, where uh, uh, people from the university and are coming to the schools and are doing a walk it out program with our uh, with the schools um, uh, three times a week. We're getting it up from once a week to three times a week. And then uh, even doing parental cooking classes uh, in the evening uh, so that we can try and share the, the good uh, health, healthy eating habits uh, and really educate the adults as much as we need to educate the, uh, to, uh, educate the students. Uh, we've done BMI um, um, and body fat and bone density measurements so that we can actually begin to get some measurables on this to really see whether we're moving the needle on this issue uh, to right, try and reverse that trend. Uh, as uh, Leon mentioned, we did a, a Healthy Food and Active Living Summit uh, where we brought in a lot of uh, great experts uh, and a lot of discussion. We had probably 600 people over two days that attended it. And uh, uh, we were very pleased to have uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, who gave our keynote address uh, to the scores of partners that are committed to trying to make Little Rock a healthier and a wiser place to live, work, and play. So these momentums really are led from a city initiative to try and give the, uh, uh, the framework and to keep all of the various parties that are at play in our city moving in the right direction and not, and not uh, jumping on top of each other, which is important. Um, in summary, let me just say that, you know, this less move cities in town uh, concept that uh, NLC has and that the First Lady has are obviously designed to do hopefully what you will do after you leave here uh, this weekend and that's to spur action to uh, convene and align support in your community. Uh, uh, you can find the research. It's easy to find the research in your own local areas uh, that's evidence-based and policy-driven. And, and, and so uh, once you find out and really get the leaders who frame policy, be it a city council, be it a school district board, uh, uh, be it your university institutions or your uh, other institutions, uh, you can really then begin to take that policy and figure out how policy can be implemented into action. Uh, obviously, as the NLC suggests, this holistic approach, bringing all parties in together is very important. And then ultimately coming up with some of the specifics like I talked about very quickly here uh, that are targeted and uh, that are measurable. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'm glad to share a little bit with you about what the city of Lurok did. Thank you, Mayor Sotola. And we're going to take questions at the end, but I'd like to uh, bring up very quickly Mayor Jack Reed from Tupelo, Mississippi, home of Elvis Presley, which I had a chance yeah. to visit when I was there. Um, because you can please join me in welcoming Mayor Jack Reed. There you go. Thank you, Mr. 
right there. Well, good afternoon. Glad to see everybody. The last meeting I was with with Leon, we each had to stand up and start exercising in place. And I don't know if we have time enough to do that uh, today, but uh, he, he's an energetic uh, leader. So uh, thank you, uh, Leon, for inviting me. A real honor for us from Tupelo. We're a town of 36,000. Uh, we are Elvis's birthplace. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, and I haven't been a mayor all my life. Just the last two years before that, uh, I was in a, and, and still uh, work in a family 106-year-old uh, retail clothing uh, store. And then uh, thank you, family business. That says a lot, 106 years. It, it does, and I don't look that old either. But uh, my grand my grandfather started that. But uh, my two sisters and. My dad, who's 87, still still works there, and, and they picked up some of the slack since I had a lobotomy and ran for mayor and <laughs> got elected, so he'll have to do a good job now. Um, but uh, anyway, mayors do have an opportunity to affect change in their cities. Uh, when I ran for mayor, I had five visions. Too loud? Too low? Too loud? Um, gotcha. I'm speaking into the light. That's pretty smart, isn't it? Um, um, I had five uh, five visions. One was uh, one was strong, safe, attractive neighborhoods in every part of town. So every part of town is a good part of town. One was Tupelo to be a center of lifelong learning, including early childhood. One was uh, servant leadership from the mayor's office. One, another one was. Um, a good job for every man, woman, and youth in Tupelo that needed one, and then one was to be the healthiest city in Mississippi, which from that graph seems like pretty low-hanging fruit uh, to be such an unhealthy state, but you need to start uh, somewhere. So the uh, first thing I did after a month after I became mayor was to uh, put out a call for citizen volunteers. We've always said Tupelo's greatest assets were our people. We're not on the coast or the foot of a mountain. We don't have any great geographic uh, uh, location, but uh, Put out a call, and, and in a week I had 100 volunteers, and the only requirements were a lot of work and no pay. But these were people who just had never been asked before to participate in city government, and and one of the task forces we formed was the mayor's uh, task force on the healthiest city. So everything I'm getting ready to show you is done by non-paid volunteers, just people in our city. Um, so here we go. I don't have any charts. I only have pictures. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is... Uh, in joint use opportunities with the school system. Tupelo Public Schools still have 95% of our children still go to the public schools. Um, Safe Splash program, this is teaching every second grader in Tupelo to learn to swim. Um, we, uh, we have that program, so, you know, like I said, through our Tupelo Park Recreation Department and the school system. Uh, this year, all 620 of the, hey, I bet this light will be useful now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, other than the fake microphone, um, uh, said we had 620 second graders go through the program. Leon, guy, what a what a techie! Uh, and um, these are some of the we had volunteer instructors, and there their certificates. And not only will that hopefully keep uh, all of these children from uh, uh, perishing in, in a horrible drowning accident one day, but it uh, also gives them a, an exercise for life and, and something that they can be proud of. So uh, every second grader in Tupelo now uh, does that. And uh, you've got some of the principal of school is the, the bigger gentleman over there, the guy next to him, the adult is the leader, the chairman of our mayor's healthy uh, task force. Um, mayor's Marathon. Uh, I, Stole this idea from Little Rock, North Little Rock, uh, Little Rock, Mayor, Little Rock. That's that's important. That's an important thing. It's kind of like Coke and Pepsi. There's uh, a bunch of North Little Rock people here, so you better say something nice about them. Whole lot. Well, I also met the the uh, Mayor of North Little Rock at the last obesity conference. He was a bright guy. Too. I mean, these are obviously the two brightest mayors in America: North Little Rock and Little Rock. So. Um, but uh, anyway, the, we took this, our, our, uh, we unabashedly uh, stole this idea. We, I think we maybe adapted it a little bit. We've had it for two years. We only have 36,000 people in Tupelo. The first year we had 4,000 people complete the Mayor's Marathon. It's pretty good. Uh, thank you. And uh, we had, there we are on the first, we walked the first two miles together. The Mayor's Marathon was uh, 26.2 miles in a month, not a day. 
You can do it a mile a day, which is 15 minutes. You can do two miles a day. But the idea is to get into the habit of doing it. And um, again, uh, here we are. This was at the, the starting line of the first two miles. We walked to the farmer's market. We walked from one of the places we worked at, so two miles to our local farmer's market. It was fun. My wife and I uh, led that there uh, as one of the uh, ex-coaches of the football team, Coach Davis. And uh, you can see how the... African American and the honky don't really hit up on the high fives uh, too well together there. Uh, but we're both happy, you know, we're both having a good time. And uh, but Coach Davis and I are, are big buddies. His wife is actually the vice president of our city council, three term vice uh, chairman of our city council. Um, three foot law, uh, if we're going to encourage people to ride bikes, it needs to be safe to ride a bike. In Tupelo, we don't really have a culture of a lot of bike riding, a lot of humidity in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, but um, we uh, passed the first three-foot law in the state of Mississippi. The state itself actually uh, uh, passed a statewide three-foot law after this. But uh, this is—it's a law to give three feet to to, to a cyclist. And uh, so there we are at the. Uh, um, the, the first sign of the first three-foot law. Uh, there's some of our uh, bikers. Um, that's bicyclists, not motorcycle bikers. And there's a big Pepsi helped underwrite this. Um, this proves I can still hula hoop at age uh, 60. Uh, this is Project Fit, which is a we got a $75,000 grant from Blue Shield Blue Cross of Mississippi to put Project Fit into three of our elementary schools. Uh, this money went to outdoor and indoor physical fitness equipment, structured physical fitness curriculum, and training for our PE teachers. Um, there's a group that every Tuesday night at City Hall, uh, they're called the, uh, let's see, Tupula, uh, let's see, hula hoop, tupula, tupula hoopula hoops or something. I don't know what their name is, but anyway, where they hula hoop for exercise every Tuesday when I leave at City Hall, I see them out there hula hooping and having a good time. Uh, the kids love this, you know. I don't think being the mayor is that big a deal, but elementary school kids do, and uh, so in fact that may be I may be most popular among elementary school kids. It's too bad they can't vote, but uh, so they love me going into the schools and participating with them and things like that. Uh, this is some of the games they have. You know, if you make anything a game and they accidentally get fit by playing a game, that's great. This is, kid is enjoying doing push-ups. When was the last time you got a kick out of doing push-ups? But he was trying to beat the kid next to him. Uh, this is something really wonderful. If you ever get a chance to come to Tupelo, and I hope you will, give me a call and I'll take you to HealthWorks. This is only the second one of these in the country. Again, we took a model in uh, uh, South Bend, Indiana and, and, uh, and built it in uh, Indiana. There we go. But uh, uh, built one in Tupelo. It's a children's health education center. And the whole idea is around changing behaviors. Uh, it's not making you feel guilty. It's showing you why you want to be healthy. For example, they've got a, I don't think there's a picture of it here, but there's a, one of the things is a cafeteria, and the food choices have how many laps around the football field it would take to work off that choice. So it says breakfast, and here come Cheerios. If you pick up Cheerios, I guess probably unsweetened, not honey nut Cheerios, it might say, you know, three laps. You pick up a honey bun, 25 laps. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything to say you're overweight, you should be embarrassed. It's just, hey, this is what you're choosing. This is how many laps it would take to choose those things. We've got uh, our family and our, our store really believe in this, and we were one of the sponsors for it. But it's a, it's a, um, well, it's a multi-million dollar facility. It's in an old Kroger store, but we've had in two years, 45,000 students on field trips come from all over the Mid-South, Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee to come uh, see it. Uh, that's 45,000 school children and all 67,000 people when you count the adults and the teachers. Um, you get prizes. I mean, the, the whole thing, we got a wonderful staff. You know, it's contagious and these kids come out of it. This is what, if you saw the city display, we were, uh, Leon mentioned this, we were honored to be uh, part of the um, city displays up there, one of 24. Uh, any of you heard of Elf on a Shelf? 
the, you know, you have the elf and, and you have a little children. Maybe you're either too young or too old to have grandchildren or children do this. But you have a little elf and all year long the, you put the elf around in the children's room and say, you know, the elf is watching you and he's going to tell, we're going to send him to Santa in his workshop the week before Christmas. And so you move him around everywhere. Well, this is a play on the words called Health on a Shelf. But this is our way to get healthy choices in convenience stores. Talk about food deserts. And this, this, is a, this has been a very successful way to get our convenience stores to have healthy food choices in the convenience stores. We've got a whole program uh, that's working uh, their way in our convenience stores in, in Tupelo so that people in, that live in parts of towns that don't have grocery stores uh, with healthy food choices will have. These, every snack in there is under 250 calories and then they're also uh, Salads and fruit cups and all this sort of thing um, as well. Maybe you saw that display. Uh, farmer's market. We have a farmer's market like so many cities now, hopefully almost all cities. Uh, we have fun at that. We have a, a children's farmer's market now where children grow things and come in and sell so they can make some money actually being young farmers. Um, and this is just, again, we have children's activities at the farmer's market as well as music and those sorts of things. Uh, community gardens, we have community gardens. I know that's not uh, uh, unique at all either, but it is, it's, a, it's a fun thing. Why We try to put these in different parts of the community. Uh, we we uh, partner with some churches that have these as well as uh, uh, civic clubs. Um, Monday, our public works department opened up two acres that they had secretly planted mustard greens on. Two acres of mustard greens in the paper just said, come get your must come come harvest mustard greens, courtesy of the city of Tupelo. Just oh, you know, oh I didn't realize those were mustard greens over there. Just again, just something fun to show that the city is part of of participating in uh, in healthy food choices. Uh, this is these are the community gardens and some of the um, folks that help uh, adults that help. This is because the guy on the left is is going to be on the Food Channel. He is just he's the most creative young uh, chef, and he did this. He came. He was on. He was on the. He volunteered. One of these people that volunteered to be on the mayor's task force on Healthy City, and he said, "I want to do something with the kids in the schools." And he has from A to Z every. He's got a, a, a food from apples to zucchini. He goes into the schools, he, he cooks them, he lets the kids taste them, try them, all these. I mean, if you saw him in action, you'd just say, man, I wish my child had a chance to, uh, to be a part of that. See what, how much fun they're having. He loves this. This guy's a great chef. I mean, if you went to a nice party, he might well be helping cater that party. But he just he has a passion for it. This is what he wants to do. And that's what I'm saying, really, is if, if I leave you with anything else, there are people in our communities, your communities, who will be great advocates for you if you just open the door and say, you know, if you're excited about this, we've got an opportunity for you to help. I haven't paid him a penny to do this. He's, he's excited about the opportunity to do it. Um, with some of our money from Blue Cross, we have billboards. Again, just the marketing. Of, um, we're going to have more biking. We need the kids to wear helmets, obviously. These are just some of the billboards that are around town. Last thing I'll just say before I, I move on, because I know we've got another great speaker in comments is that the um, there there are some things that we are doing to where the mayor and the council can put some money uh, leave that up for example last uh, last month we passed a bond issue to build 11.3 million dollar new aquatic center uh, you know there's some things that only government can do and that's you know swimming is another sport for life there are lots of things, lots of positive things about doing it. So I'm not, I'm not abdicating financial responsibility when I give all these examples of things that haven't cost any money. I'm recognizing that cities do have an important place that only cities can't, some things only cities can do. But uh, together with things, volunteer things and cities can do, maybe we can all make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Reed. And our final speaker is uh, Mr. Tyler Norris. If you can join me in welcoming Tyler Norris for me. Thank you, Leon. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Very, very good to see you here. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I serve as senior advisor to Kaiser Permanente, which is our nation's largest integrated health delivery system. But I also wear a few other hats. I've been head coach for the YMCA's Pioneering Healthier Communities Initiative, which has about 200 sites around the nation working with WISE, trying to do the kind of work the good mayors were talking about. And I've been working very actively as well uh, with uh, Let's Move and the Partnership for Healthier America on the First Ladies Initiative to bring civic leaders and business leaders together to make commitments to address the kind of issues like our good cities are, are doing here. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to tell you a little bit about what we're seeing happen broadly across the United States and as Leon pointed out to tell you a little bit about the community commons. I think it'll be a very, very useful resource uh, to you all here. One thing I want to say uh, before I get into this too much, and I always like to have kind of the eyes of, of our children on us here. My daughter's a, a freshman in college this year and she's been paying a little attention to what I've been doing over the years and she said, Dad, uh, how you doing on that obesity work here you've been dedicating so much of your life to? I think Leon showed the maps a little earlier and I think, uh, you, you know, there's a pretty big conversation I'm having with her and with both of my kids about how are we doing on our watch and have we actually created the food environments and the beverage environments and the built environments and the social environments that really allow that healthier choice to occur or are the default environments in our community actually pulling healthy choices away which I think is really what we're talking about there is nothing about what we're discussing you ever let sound like some nanny state thing this is about access to healthy choices in our lives. And right now, so many of the people in our communities do not have access. And that's what I know you're working on so hard, is to make sure that healthy choice is available uh, to all of our residents. One of the things we're doing within Kaiser Permanente is something called the Heal Cities Campaign. And I'm uh, really glad to have our colleagues uh, Charlotte Dixon and Kanat Tibet here with us uh, from the California Center for Public Health Advocacy. In California, we've been working to engage over 250 California California cities and hundreds and hundreds of mayors and elected leaders and others in looking at how do you implement what the first lady has been talking about through model policies and strategies for the built-in food environment. We're very, very excited about what's happening and there may be folks you want to talk with. We're now expanding that in the Portland area and in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and talking some with the National League of Cities about how we make that more available uh, broadly uh, so that we have a real infrastructure underneath Let's Move Cities, Towns and Counties and, and we can learn a little bit more about that and I hope you meet uh, my colleagues here about that. I think some very, very powerful strategies for Heal Cities resolutions and what really works and how do you implement that in, in, our, in our elected leaders. So um, I was in Detroit earlier this week uh, for the Equity Summit. Uh, some of you may be familiar that was going on. And one of the things we were talking about is that the desire to improve the lot of our cities is as old as settled agriculture. This is not new. And yet there has never been a time where our civic leadership and our elected leadership and city councils and county commissions are more important to the health of our society. Warren Buffett the other day went on record saying there is no question that the chronic disease trends in our nation will crowd out any real growth in our economy. No matter how fast our economy could grow as it turned around, we will grow faster in demands on our sick care system that will crowd out any investments we could put right back in education, fresh food and all that. We have got to turn uh, that around and that's really uh, what's going on. And I wanted to point out the uh, excellent point you made, uh, Mayor Stodl, about, about health care organizations and being affiliated with one. We need to challenge ourselves more deeply. As elected leaders and as citizens, you know that there are new requirements through the Affordable Care Act for hospitals and health plans that are nonprofits to do community health needs assessments. But it is not only a requirement to do the assessments, it's a requirement to invest based on them. And in the next couple of years, those IRS requirements are going to a whole other level. And you're going to have an opportunity as your nonprofit mission oriented hospitals, who, by the way, you own because they are nonprofit mission oriented hospitals, are going to be putting nationwide $50 billion of investment back in community benefit. And you can help shape what that looks like as they do their assessments and tie their assessments with what United Ways and the Chamber of Commerce and community foundations and others are doing. So I think a really important please. 
disease. Not to mention the fact that those hospitals are going to get reimbursed less when that person that they discharge gets readmitted for a chronic disease. And they're going to desperately need partnership with the city to create those healthy environments rather than putting people back into toxic food environments. They're going to, so there's some real opportunities, I think, there um, with cities. About 25 years ago, the Healthy Cities model was in, initiated in the United States. And the underlying message here is that if we are going to fundamentally improve the health status of our country, it will not come through better health or hospital or public health policy. It's going to come through healthier public policies on the determinants of health. And just as our good mayors have been talking about, education, the work environment, agriculture, employment, sanitation, these are the determinants of health. These are the areas that are driving, and hence why our civic and city leadership and, and so forth is so important to being able to bring health in all policies, to make healthy public policy the watchword, so that whether you're looking at a transit policy, a housing strategy, a food procurement policy, policy, you're asking the question, does it return to health? Vital question. Because, as this chart reminds us, that the majority of what creates health is in our behaviors and our environments. 10% is medical care. But it's not just about our health behaviors. We've been trying for 25 years to get people to change behaviors, and there's been no impact. And the reality of it is, is we have to change the environments within which people make choices about what they eat and how they move their body. That's why that policy systems environmental change that Leon was talking about at the beginning is so important to get it where the, the leverage really is. Now, healthy cities these days, healthy communities these days, goes by a thousand names across our country. But it is impossible to find some self-respecting national organization that doesn't begin to understand what this is about. So you should be able to find this and some of these principles that we've been talking about here are embedded into the thinking of your chambers of commerce and united ways because of what I want to talk about, sort of a co-benefit strategy. I'm going to show you something called the community commons in a couple minutes. And we set out a couple of, uh, a few months ago, we said, well, when we launch this thing, let's at least get a thousand of these efforts on the national map of the movement. We got 3,000. But we didn't, I mean, we worked on it, but we didn't even hardly try. We had over 3,000 initiatives on the ground. And I'll go into this in a minute of what's working. And we didn't even reach out to the initiatives that go under sustainable communities and livable communities and smart growth and community development, with working with your banks and their Community Reinvestment Act requirements, um, local food systems, early childhood strategies. And what I'm getting at by putting these up there is whether the notion is healthy cities, livable communities. This is co-benefit. When we create healthier food systems, regional food systems, when we create safer streets, and when we do placemaking downtown, we create a return to jobs, to agriculture, to the environment, to safety and health all at once. And so our leadership job right now is to be looking for co-benefit strategies, like putting full-service grocery stores and converting bodegas into healthy food places. Because when we do that, we create jobs, safer streets, health, regional agriculture, and a series of things at once. These are three-fers and four-fers we want to be looking at, again, in these very austere fiscal times, and we've got to be quite creative. Now, I won't go through this because uh, Leon and our mayors did such a good job, but I think one of the things that's most important to talk about is that the evidence base is solid. There are things we know happen in our general plans and in farmer's market and taking our community gardens to scale and multimodal transit and active living strategies in our neighborhoods uh, that work and create that kind of triple, quadruple return on investment. In our schools with nutrition standards and campus-wide uh, physical education and recess and joint use agreements, as Leon was talking about, safe routes to school, things we can do in our health care system. We ought to be measuring body mass index as a vital sign. At Kaiser Permanente, we're going to start to have physical activity be a vital sign. When we see somebody that's at risk for chronic disease, we're not only going to say, do you smoke, which most of us get asked by our physician when we go to visit, but tell me a little bit about your physical activity. And if that person's at risk, we don't know, we want to make a warm handoff with their local YMCA or with the local rec center or the faith-based partnerships in the community so that there's a handoff from the clinician who's seeing that that person might be at risk, not just, well, you ought to you know, move your body a bit more. We all know that. But 
how do you engage with that partnership like the ones in our cities so that our healthcare organizations are driving that warm handoff before somebody needs clinical services and on the other side of that when they're being discharged now you really need that partnership so that person goes back in so really vital pieces with uh, what is now 18 percent of our nation's uh, uh, gross domestic product. The only other thing I want to say about this is, uh, is that it is not enough to have a walk to school day. And it's not enough to have a walk to school year. We need to do safe routes to school. We need to have our uh, complete streets resolutions. And we need to make sure there's physical activity uh, that is enforced in our schools because we need surround sound. And the same thing on the food side. It's not just about reducing 50% of the junk out of your vending machines. It's about complete vending machine bands of junk, as you have done in Little Rock. And, and then what's served in the cafeteria? And how are we procuring food? And what is the neighborhood food environment? I mean, I had two teenagers. A number of you are young. And you don't darn well. You don't like what's served in the cafeteria. You go to the pizza place across the street. Surround sound looks like it is impossible to not have healthy foods as a choice wherever you are. That's the kind of systemic, high-dose strategies that are going to add up for health and all policies. And I just want to pick on my colleagues in, in uh, Omaha who, like uh, Tupelo and Little Rock, have become what you might think of as a super integrator, where they are really going to scale. They have changed the conversation. Business, government, nonprofit, the insurance plans, the hospitals, the mayors, the Chamber of Commerce are all involved. When the state legislature from Lincoln is asking the question, what kind of investments ought we make? They go to Live Well Omaha because it's integrating the thinking across all the sectors of what are the policies and the investments that make sense. And I think part of our job is to move from purveyors of a handful of good projects and programs around to how do we link those at scale and sufficient dose as investment and policy advisors for the health and wealth of our communities, not just purveyors of good programs. We go to our, insure, you know, our investment advisors to help us save money for college or retirement. Our partnerships need to be those long-term investment advisors for the future of our communities, not just someone who's running short projects. We started a conversation in the nation a couple years ago called Advancing the Movement with uh, funders, uh, the uh, community partnerships, um, technical assistance providers, policy organizations to do two things. One, saying we need to get smarter as a nation and build our efficacy to get smarter about what works in the country. Secondly, if you took those community partnerships all across the country, all these 3,000 that we just found without even hardly looking, that the business, government, nonprofit, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter who's Republican, Democrat, and the kind of thing. These are transpartisan strategies that make sense to our communities. And we believe that those kind of partnerships can cut through the partisan toxicity in our country right now that turns any one of these issues into a political football. Those local partnerships know how to think. And we think if we lift those up nationally, uh, we're going to be able to have an impact. I won't spend a lot of time on the founding of all this. We've had some great partnerships. What I'd like to do is go to the site. Actually, before I do that, those nice maps that uh, Mayor Stodla uh, showed you just a minute ago, um, we are making the technology uh, to make those kind of heat maps, like this one that our colleagues in Louisville made. Um, they made this in 10 minutes on our platform for free. This is now totally free, transparent to every community in the country. A lot of you young people here I've been talking with, universities, schools, and so forth. It's a whole career path here around making GIS maps and tying videos to them to tell stories that inform communities how they're performing and making the case for policy change, and uh, then the, showing the evidence base of what's working on very, very exciting areas of new ways of the quantitative and the qualitative story being available. And that's what the Commons does um, uh, for, uh, for free uh, that we have just launched. Um, very briefly, I just want to go to this, and uh, Leon, would you mind, mind passing it? If, if you just want to, want to take one of those, and if you run out, I've got more of them. Communitycommons.org went live uh, on Halloween, and we've been working on it about 14 months, talked about a 1,000 communities across the country, what do you want to help move the movement forward? 
And I'll show you very briefly that I'm live on the site right now, how we're connecting the movement, how we're engaging the movement in deeper work, how we're discovering by making maps and so forth and learning what's working. Um, one of the features on Connect, as I just had up a minute ago, is a map of the United States that real time has over 3,000 initiatives loaded up on it. And this is loading real time. That's why you'll see it takes just a minute on this wireless connection to, to come up. But one of the features here would be to say, uh, I want to zoom in in my community. And I'll do that. I'll zoom in as this loads just a minute in where I live in Colorado to show um, what all is going on in my own area. But what if I wanted to say, I, I want to see all the different uh, initiatives across the country that the CDC is funding with through their Achieve initiative, or uh, the, these uh, communities putting prevention to work, the stimulus funds that you're familiar with. Let's just say I turned all those off for a second. And I wanted to say, where were those stimulus funds going? Well, there they all are. How about these community transformation grants that were just released out there a little bit ago? Well, there they are, right? Maybe I go down here and say, let's look at the First Ladies Initiative. Let's move cities, towns, and counties. Where are they in the nation? And how do they line up back to the points that we're making with all the other efforts? There's a lot of different ways to search. But what I want to do here is to then uh, to show you some other ways that you can search and find out what's going on uh, in, the, in the community. And I'll kind of zoom in. I might say, you know, that's all nice, Tyler. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. All I really am working on right now is I want to see who is doing nutrition policies in child care settings. Oh. I want to see who's doing screen time strategies in child care settings. And we can go down here, community neighborhood strategies, who's working with their faith-based organizations, transportation strategies, uh, what's happening in clinical settings, who's doing what in their food and beverage environments. I think you get the picture. You can search for who's doing what around the country and find uh, like colleagues uh, that are doing um, the good work uh, anywhere in the nation. Um, I'm just going to click and zoom on in to, uh, to, I need to, time. thank you. I'm just going to give you another sense of this by zooming on into my own community of Denver and to be able to see as the, uh, as the mayors were talking about what this does any place in the country is it'll tell you what all the initiatives are so that you can make sure that they're coming together. We have over 20 now, thanks to Joe Thompson and your Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Center in the Little Rock and all that area so you can go in and see who else is doing what and connect that. That's not only true in their cities. This is true around the nation. Um, we have places for dialogues, and the only thing I'll show you is this free GIS mapping capability, and then I'll sit down so we can have some dialogue. We have 7,000 data layers loaded up in here, so you will be able to make your own maps of your food deserts, your play deserts, where safety issues are, how many percent of kids are eligible for that free and reduced lunch immediately surrounding those schools, what do those food environments look like. That's now available free, transparent to the country with dialogue, and we hope that becomes a really useful uh, resource to help uh, our, our nation uh, take this work to scale, and not just some good projects, but really tackle this and turn the tide on obesity, and at the same time, change our food systems and economics and jobs. So I'll, with that, I think I'll better stop, and we'll have a little dialogue. So thank you, Tyler, and thank you to both Mayor Stodla and Mayor Reed. Uh